Hello everyone. Uh, so welcome back to the uh, session on Rodin behavioral setups. So today probably is the last session that we are dealing with with respect to the neural engineering aspects of surgery and the behavioral setups and various um, you know the aspects that we have covered. So we have come um, uh, to an end of this <coughs> neuro neural engineering course. Uh, so I am trying to wind it up with the very important aspect of the uh, one of the behavioral models that is uh, popular uh, that is of the Parkinsonian model. So last uh, session we covered the uh, stroke in terms of the definition, the clinical features, how do we set up and how what sort of behavior that we need to look, um, look up for and then how the analysis is done. So just exactly in the same uh, similar manner we try and cover uh, Parkinsonism as well. Uh, this is uh, a particularly uh, very popular model as I said both for from uh, pharmacology you know and uh, where they conduct various uh, drug trials and even the newer discoveries of drugs are based on rodent models and then of course the, the entire neural engineering aspect comes in where the brain computer uh, interface devices are implanted in the rodent and then Parkinsonian uh, model is created to analyze those uh, various implants. So it is a very important model. What we are trying to cover is the uh, basic aspects of the uh, Parkinsonian model which, is, which serves you as a foundation and on top of which uh, you can sort of uh, modify uh, based on your research questions. So first and foremost how do you define Parkinsonian disease? What, 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 is, what exactly is Parkinson's disease? I guess, uh, understanding bit, bit about the disease itself is very important because stroke was uh, slightly straightforward where um, you know there is the blood vessel which gets blocked and that leads to neural cell death. So there the pathophysiology is pretty um, uh, simple, uh, however part, when it comes to Parkinson's the anatomy of basal ganglia itself is pretty complex and the pathophysiology, the clinical features all are a uh, little complex and hence it becomes a, a really gold mine for various research that is still going on to understand how exactly a brain uh, decodes and encodes various information and make sure the human movements are pretty smooth and coordinated. So let us go through the uh, basics of Parkinson's disease and the pathophysiology to uh, make you all understand what are the aspects that you need to sort of recreate in the rodents, alright. So to begin with Parkinson's disease you need to understand that it is a progressive disorder unlike stroke which is an acute uh, you know it is an emergency. So stroke will happen once and then there is a block, yes of course it can progress in that short time, a short period but then it reaches a plateau uh, within a week or so. So there are recurrent stroke that can happen but then Parkinson is an entirely um, different entity where it is caused by the degeneration of nerve cells. So you need to understand this keyword here, degeneration refers to loss of neurons, you know, not because of the ischemia that you see in stroke, it is not nothing to do with the blood supply per se, it, yes but it might play a role but then degeneration is gradually the cell start, starts dying you know due to various uh, reasons which we come across in the next few slides. So there is degeneration which is progressive in nature in the part of the brain called substantia nigra alright which is involved in the control of the mov any movement that happens in the human body or animals. So substantia nigra as you see I will come into the uh, detail anatomy later is part of the midbrain here, okay. Niagara word refers to something blackish, okay. So 
this has melanin pigment in it when you take a cross section you can see a band which is in blackish in color due to the melanin in neuronal cells all right so there are different divisions in that which undergoes degeneration so when that happens the substantia nigra is involved in the control of the movement so what is this control movement control actually refers to whenever a uh, a person has to reach out to a target here there is a certain distance that need to cover and there is a trajectory that needs to you know the, the efficient trajectory has to happen if you rem remember the visa test ex for example in the rodan model the rat has to take a particular a uh, path to reach the target when it learns that movement it becomes more efficient and takes less time and takes a shorter path so that's much more complex movements happens in human uh, brain where for example a musician playing an instrument or for example playing a guitar or a piano the right note has to be uh, it has to come in sequence so those those uh, sort of um, very fine coordinated movements happens because of the two structures called basal ganglia and cerebellum all right so then you would wonder what is motor cortex is doing motor cortex is the ultimate uh, region where the signals goes down but then this signal has to be modulated by these two these two control switches that is a basal ganglia and cerebellum all right so i'll talk about these in a bit of detail so basically this is affected so this sort of modulation of the movement is controlled by substantia nigra part of midbrain because the neuronal cells in substantia nigra undergoes degeneration or gradual loss and that tends to be progressive and so that's that's where the parkinson's disease comes in it's named after james parkinson who discovered this particular disease in an individual which he called uh, the uh, fits you know some palsy with fits because basically patient had tremor you know so that from there he um, started describing this particular uh, disease so it named after a person james parkinson who is a physician so and that's how the uh, disease is named and this is these are the core feature of the parkinson's disease so how do you sort of remember the cardinal manifestation for example in stroke i said be fast as a mnemonic to remember all the components here it's trap literally patient does look like being trapped in you know some sort of uh, situation basically because they are rigid okay and they, there is akinesia akinesia is loss or impairment in power of voluntary movement they want to reach out to a target they need to reach out to a glass of water but then they are rigid they they really can't move so inability to move is akinesia which can happen in even in absence of rigidity but mostly it is rigidity which is causing akinesia and then there is tremor tremor is a general um, common parlance where there is constant movement of the digits as well as hands classically it is known as pill rolling tremor all right it appears as though the patient is rolling some pill in his hand is because of the movement that happens between his thumb and index finger so tremor is a very important manifestation the reason i'm trying to cover these manifestation is we need to see how you are going to replicate such features in the rodent and why does the features come in first place all that is really important to understand and before uh, you know you replicate the rodent model and see uh how much you you are going to assess the behavioral outcome or modify the behavioral outcome all right so tremor is usually 
uh, you know in hands it starts from one side and then progress to the other side rigidity is stiffness of the limb it is rigid spasticity is one compartment for example if this is a hand so hand can move that way or this way this is called dorsiflexion and towards the palm is called palmar flexion so when the tone tone is something uh, to to explain tone this is a resistance offered for any movement it's not a full resistance but when you try to move the hand of an individual even passively you feel some amount of resistance when you move the hand of a person back and forth so that resistance is called tone all right so when this tone increases it can be because of spasticity or rigidity so how do you differentiate between the two spasticity is when one compartment that is anti gravity muscles or flexor compartment of the upper limb is stronger than the extensor compartment in other words the person's hand is flexed in position this is what you see in stroke stroke causes spasticity where one of the component the tone is increased and if the tone is increased in both the compartment flexor and extensor that means it is called you know that that's that's the um manifestation of rigidity when you are really not able to move you know either dorsiflexion or palmar flexion then you will say the pa- the person's muscles are rigid you know classically it is known as lead pipe rigidity it is really stiff you are really not able to move that uh, because of the increased tone and in all all of his group of the muscles so that rigidity that sort of rigidity leads to echinacea all right so all this can affect person's posture and balance which is also a very important function of basal ganglia to maintain the posture mainly by acting on his axial muscles axial muscle is something comes around the vertebra if you remember the rodent spinal anatomy similar to that uh, the human basic anatomy will have paravertebral muscles so those are the muscle which maintains the posture you know this is back so in back of any um, person there are these muscles come latissimus dorsi comes and then there is levator scapulae then there are trapezius most important is erector spinae muscles all right and then the, all these lumbar paraspinal muscles all these muscles act together to maintain the erect posture so when the rigidity affects those muscles it causes postural imbalance these are the, they are really rigid and not really flexible which needs to be adjusted as the uh, situation demands like that happens in normal individual which is a function of cerebellum and basal ganglia so when those structures are diseased they lose their posture they lose their balance all right so these are the very important cardinal manifestation so along with that they'll have masked a facial expression where there are hardly any features in their face you know the blink they don't blink very often they look just uh, the same there is no emotional component seen in there not just not that they don't want to smile or anything but they can't you know the, because the muscles are rigid it affects every single muscle in the body and then there is forward tilt of the trunk and then this arm swing is reduced hip and knee will be slightly flexed and this is very important the gait disturbance they have this short shuffling gait all right which is called festinian gait and that's the reason why they tend to lose balance when they walk it looks as if they're trying to catch up with the gravity and that is a, there's always a tendency to fall and they do develop a lot of these frequent falls injuring their head okay so these are some of the very important manifestation of parkinson's disease so then wh- how, what are the pathophysiological changes that happens in the brain okay so i'm not going in too much of the details just enough to sort of prime you all with this knowledge so that definitely of course if your uh, study is going to 
uh, demand more and you are going to study only the Parkinson model, then I guess you definitely need to go a lot about it, need to know a lot about it. If it's a neural engineering and see implants that you're really going to use, then you know this much of basics probably would suffice. But in any way, it's, it's always good to know more than what has been uh, covered here. So in Parkinson's disease, this is where it is affected. This is substantial Niagara as I said earlier. This is the axial section of the human brain. That is the midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata and that is the whole brain. This is entirely it is called brain stem. If you all remember the session on neuroanatomy, in brain stem you have the midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. All right? that is the cerebellum and that is the cerebrum all right that is in a nutshell the the whole brain anatomy so this is where the substantia nigra is in midbrain because of the melanin pigmentation as i said earlier and this part is known as crust cerebri okay so there are many causes which are uh, hypothesized and uh, there is a definite uh, genetic underpinning but which may not be there in all the individuals. So because some mutation as the age progresses and with environmental toxic insults, there occurs a misfolding of the protein called synuclein. This synuclein are, are present in neurons, these are microtubule proteins involved in the transport of various neurotransmitters. So they start you know aggregate themselves because the misfolding they clump together and forms the what is known as inclusion bodies. So these inclusion bodies are known called Levy bodies which are with, with neuromelanin deposition. Okay? So that is the basic apathophysiology for some reason this synuclein starts getting aggregated and they accumulate to form inclusion body known as Levy bodies. So, PARC1 gene is what is in, in there are many uh, genes this way. So, genetic mutation along with environmental factors causes the misfolding of this alpha synuclein protein which tends to get accumulated in the neuronal um, cell bodies called Levy bodies and then that would you know stimulate our immune, immune system to cause inflammation and mitochondrial dysfunction that would release the reactive oxygen species. So this is one of the uh, pathophysiological mechanism where the neuronal cell death appears, you know the appear. So inflammation, mitochondria, all that would lead to oxidative damage to DNA, lipids and proteins. And then there is alterations in dopamine metabolism obviously the entire metabolic chain get disrupted and ultimately cell death happens that is called apoptosis. So that is how the process begins and it is progressive unfortunately. So once this process sets in it is it is going to be progressive involves multiple areas in the brain and patient is going to uh, manifest with various clinical features we just described alright. So that is the basic pathophysiological mechanism. So now let us look at the circuitry. What you saw until now was a bit of anatomy with the pathophysiological mechanism. But then if you go bit of detail into the uh, basal ganglia which is a pretty complex three dimensional structure in the core of the this is human brain anatomy alright. So I am just trying to say where exactly things go wrong and what are the circuitry involved because all these has its role in the manifestation that is the ultimate behavior of the human patients or for that matter even animal. Right. So this knowledge is important not only to know where you instill drugs to create Parkinsonian model but it also becomes a target for various uh, neural implants that are involved in uh, deep brain stimulations. So we will be using a lot of uh, you know these uh, terminology like globus pallidus, subthalamus, nucleus, substantia nigra, you know striatum. 
So, it is very important that you familiarize with these terminologies and we will see in, in simple terms how these structures are arranged and what are the relations with each other. So, the basal ganglia neural circuitry has two pathways. So, it is basically a wiring diagram if you see every single uh, function in human brain it has its own wiring net I mean those are networks. For example, motor system networks has primary area, secondary motor area and then its relation with the sensory uh, cortex, how it forms a corticospinal tract and then descends down into the spinal cord. So, that is how the motor system work, but then it is also important to understand these neuromodulatory functions of basal ganglia and cerebellum because various pathophysiology, various um, clinical manifestation um, appears because of the um, diseases affecting this particular part of the nervous system. So, let us look at the first uh, section of direct pathway. It is called direct because it is a simple loop wherein the information from the motor cortex goes into the basal ganglia, it is processed over here and then sent back into the motor cortex for modulation. All right, then the final output descends into spinal cord. So, you all have to remember that this higher center maintains the tone by influencing the alpha motor neuron of spinal cord. Spinal cord. If you remember the axial section of the spinal cord, it has dorsal horn and ventral horn. The ventral horn has the alpha motor neuron and gamma motor neuron. It is the alpha motor neuron which receives input through the interneuron and then the final output that goes to the muscle belly is through alpha motor neuron. So, this tract is corticospinal tract and there are other tracts called reticulospinal tract, rubrospinal tract and vestibulospinal tract. So, all these tracts comes from various different structures. One is reticular activating system, other one is red nucleus of the midbrain then there is vestibular nuclei of the um, medulla and pons. So, various structures gives rise to these fibers and has, has influence on the tone that I was talking to you all about. So, this tone is regulated in this way. It is the higher center based on the information from the motor cortex and associative areas decides that yes, now the tone has to change for the person to make a final movement. Alright, so, that regulation of tone is very, very important. All right. So, cerebellum controls this tone indirectly by sending the information back into the brain and then there is a modulation happens in basal ganglia, then the final output comes through the corticospinal tract as I just explained. So, this entire thing happens in the basal ganglia through two pathways, one is direct and the indirect. So, the major component is obviously the motor cortex. From the motor cortex, it goes to striatum. What is striatum? Putamen and globus pallidus together is called striatum. It is confusing. Let me erase this for you. So, this whole structure is called striatum, which will have caudate and putamen. All right. This is globus pallidus. So, sorry, once again, let me go through it. So, caudate and putamen sends the inhibitory influence to the internal globus pallidus. This is this is globus pallidus. So, this is globus pallidus externum, globus pallidus internum. All right. So, this is caudate and this is putamen. So, these two are called striatum. So, when it sends an in, uh, inhibitory influence on the internal globus pallidus and substantia nigra pars reticulata. So, this is this is an inhibitory uh, influence from the striatum all right. The motor cortex stimulates the striatum, striatum inhibits the um, internal globus pallidus and substantia nigra that sends the inhibitory part to the thalamus, but thalamus to cortex is excitatory. So, ultimately the thalamocortical is Internally, it is always excitatory, all right. 
by status uh, it is always excitatory, it is a tonic uh, neurons which sends the excitatory signal. So, this is kept in check by this double inhibition that is happening alright. So, it keeps in check not to overshoot. For example, if a person is trying to reach a ball, it should not overshoot. So, that impulse gets checked only to reach the target by this inhibitory influence. So, but then the ultimate output is actually excitatory because the inhibitory neurons are getting inhibited by the striatum. So, direct pathway becomes indirectly a facilitatory pathway, wherein the tonic inhibition from the globus pallidus is kept in check by the inhibitory output from the striatum. It is inhibiting the inhibitory neuron. So, it becomes excitatory ultimately. So, it is a facilitatory pathway, direct pathway is a facilitatory pathway. So, direct and indirect acts in tandem, one facilitates the movement, one blocks the movement and that is where the entire pathophysiology comes in. So, if you look into the indirect pathway, you have an extra component called subthalamic nuclei, okay, which is ton tonic inhibition, which is always inhibitory to the thalamocortical output which is excitatory. All right. So, this keeps in check and this is inherently inhibitory in nature. Direct pathway was facilitatory, indirect pathway is inhibitory. Cortex send the impulses again to striatum, then it goes to globus pallidus. Unlike the direct pathway which goes directly to internal globus pallidus, this goes to external globus pallidus then it sends an input to subthalamic nucleus, then it goes, then it goes back into the internal globus pallidum, from there it goes to thalamus, that is why it becomes indirect, all right, because there is an uh, inhibitory pathway back into the internal globus pallidus and substantia nigra reticulata that sends an inhibitory output to the thalamus. So, the ultimate output of the subthalamic nucleus and ultimate function of subthalamic nucleus is to inhibit the moment that is happening. So, indirect pathway is inhibitory, direct pathway is excitatory. So, there is a very close interplay between these two pathways to make sure a particular moment should be facilitated or it should be inhibited, so that the intended target is always achieved or right, that the trajectory is achieved and the time taken to reach that particular target is also achieved. So, that balance is that critical balance is maintained by the interplay of indirect and direct pathway. So, then what happens in the uh, Parkinson disease? Okay. This is a good comparison between the normal and Parkinsonism uh, circuitry. So, if you remember the same uh, illustrative picture which I had shown, you have a striatum here, all right, and you have the output from the globus pallidum externum, subthalamic nucleus is in inherently inhibitory, all right. So, this gets knocked out in the Parkinsonism where the inhibitory output of subthalamic nucleus increases. So, the ultimate drive from the thalamocortical output goes down because that is the output which drives the movement, all right. So, that is because if you see this diagram here, the substantia nigra compactor which sends the excitatory impulses to the D2 uh, neuronal cells which is involved in the indirect pathway that starts getting degenerated. So, the damage happens in the substantia nigra which has a role to stimulate this T2, D2. So, when that goes, then the influence on GPE comes down, which actually had a inhibitory role on subthalamic nucleus to keep, keep, the, keep it in check, all right. So, this goes unchecked, the inhibitory output of subthalamic nucleus goes unchecked and becomes highly inhibitory so that the thalamocortical output goes down, then the person ends up with rigidity, echinacea and tremors. 
So, tremors obviously because of the oscillatory mechanism where there is a complete loss of balance between this facilitatory and inhibitory pathway. So, all you need to remember is that the degeneration happens in the substantia nigra compactor, then the subthalamic nucleus takes over and inhibits the output from the um, internum and it reduces the thalamocortical output. So, that is something you all need to remember to uh, summarize the entire uh, pathophysiology. Now, let us look at the Rodin models which are going to replicate what I just explained. So, you need to sort of create the neuronal loss somehow, so that the dopaminergic pathway. So, the substantia Niagara compactor is a dopaminergic pathway all right that D 2 is the receptor for the dopamine which is produced by the nerve terminals of neurons of substantia nigra. So, that loss is what re results in Parkinsonism. So, how are you going to achieve this neuronal loss? So, these are the three ways of creating such neuronal loss. One is that you directly induce toxicity by injecting these agents which will act on mitochondria to cause oxidative stress, excited toxicity and apoptosis which will result in dopaminergic cell death all right. Or you can still use something known as lactocysteine where it can result in Levy bodies and inclusion you know basically the inclusion body creation. If your research question involves creation of such inclusion bodies then this is how you need to follow the methodology. But your ultimate result is only on dopaminergic cell death, then you can follow these chemical that needs to be injected. But then you need to make a model which is similar to what is happening in the human brain, then you need to look at the progressive nature of progressive neurodegeneration. Then you do not you cannot use this particular model which you know uses neurotoxic agents, then you need to use this transgenic uh, MOS model or non transgenic uh, alpha synuclein model where you inject certain viruses to cause alteration in the alpha synuclein conformation which will cause toxic protofibrils and fibrils which is more or less similar to what exactly happens in the human brain in conditions of Parkinson's. So, these two models are pretty close to actually what happens in the pathophysiology. Though the understanding of Parkinson's are is still evolving, still lot of theories are changing that many new uh, toxic uh, agents are discovered. So, in order to be as close to the uh, human model as then you need to use these kind of models. But if it is only enough to study the manifestation of Parkinsonism, then you can just use the toxic agent and this is one of the easiest of the uh, Parkinsonian model that one can rely on because it all it requires is a stereotactic injection of these uh, toxic agent directly into the basal ganglia all right. So, these are the manifestation of various models that can be used. In a Rodin model it causes motor deficit. Levy body creation if you are using these kind of this particular agent and you can see some amount of alpha synuclein inclusions as well if you use MPTP which is very uh, toxic even for the person who is using to create such models. Or you can use the same thing in the primate model there are mice model there are drosophila model there are so n number of Parkinson models are available to conduct your research in particular in this particular Parkinsonism disease. So, when it comes to the rodent uh, basal ganglia this is how it appears and that is the location. So, if you all remember the uh, neuroanatomy rodent neuroanatomy these are the uh, various subcomponents that can sort of mimic the uh, human brain. So, you have chordoputamen globus pilus externum internum subthalamic nucleus there is substantia nigra compact and reticular. So, all these components are are available to mimic what happens in human brain. 
So, what has been shown in the example is the usage of 6 OHTA that is 6 hydroxy dopamine. So, this is the excitotoxic agent that can be injected into the uh, striatum. Then one can uh, notice that there are some changes in the volume of this particular nuclei that is brought about by the 6 OHDA. All right. So, though, though there are no gross changes, there are definite changes that occurs in the loss of the dopaminergic neurons. All right. So, that we will look into it. So, in this uh, particular session, we are considering only the 6 OHDA model that is 6 hydroxy dopamine, 6 ODA, what we popularly call. So, that model creation is pretty easy and straightforward. So, the surgical aspect has been covered. Just to summarize, you will be using the Hamilton syringe, which is a, a micro syringe of capacity of 10 microliter. So, once the rat's head is stabilized, you make a small twist drill hole using the drill and then get the Hamilton syringe uh, cannula into the brain in this part, this particular uh, target of striatum or another area the target that is commonly used medial forebrain bundle. If you are targeting striatum, it only cause partial dopaminergic loss all right. If a study wants to uh, induce a partial Parkinsonism, then striatum is a good target to consider. I mean this is a, a stereotactic coronal slice if you all remember that it will have grid lines. So, all of you remember how to calculate the stereotactic coordinates for any particular nucleus that you are choosing or any particular target that you are choosing to inject. The two commonly used targets are striatum and medial forebrain bundle. Medial forebrain bundle causes significant loss of dopaminergic neurons and produces complete Parkinsonism all right if you are injecting into the medial forebrain bundle or if it is the striatum then it causes partial loss all right. So, so, so the 6 soda is injected and then you will wait for the recovery to happen or the manifestation to um, come in terms of behavioral uh, changes. It takes around 3 to 4 weeks for the Parkinsonian features to manifest all right. So, that is very important to consider because it has to cause cell death and then various changes has to happen in the uh, basal ganglia of the rodent brain and then it shows, starts showing various uh, clinical features of Parkinsonism all right. So, the target we have covered and the drug agent is 6 hydroxy dopamine. So, once you inject the drug into the uh, targets which I just explained, there are various uh, ways of uh, looking at the manifestation of Parkinsonism which is very, very important. So, you are going to characterize a particular um, behavior and you are trying to look at a drug agent or you are trying to look at various implants that are going to uh, change this particular uh, clin uh, clinical manifestation. Then you need to familiarize with the apparatus that you are going to use. So, in next session we will deal with choosing a right apparatus. So, thank you all for uh, the kind attention. Uh, see you all.